Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. We're excited to jump into an exciting conversation, well, at least it's exciting for us and hopefully for you, about emergency notification systems. As we got started, and for a couple of you that were with us a few minutes early, uh, we asked you to share with us a couple of emergency notification systems that you have in place, or put differently, we asked you actually to share what emergency notification systems we had in place um, in the past. And as you shared, um, it looks like a handful of you are on um, the two that we'll be talking about today, Regroup and Send Word Now. Um, a couple of you are on School Reach. A handful of you are on other programs, some that are pretty common, and um, actually a couple of relatively new ones to us. And so um, as we talk today, we'll uh, spend a little bit of time talking about each of those different programs and some of the unique benefits and weaknesses and, and or challenges that you may have right along there with them. Um, today's PowerPoint uh, was created by one of our safety consultants, uh, Yadija, who is actually our Northeast safety consultant. He works from D.C. to Northern California. So uh, I'd like to just thank him for creating this PowerPoint, and uh, he's actually with one of our schools today. Interestingly enough, when Yadija creates PowerPoints for me, um, he actually shares a little bit about who I am, and I guess I forget to do that every once in a while. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'm the CEO of Joppy Emergency Services. And before starting Joffe, I worked as a firefighter and a paramedic down in northern Orange County. And I then transitioned, um, worked with kids uh, primarily um, on an air squad, which is basically just a fancy word for a helicopter. Um, and as I did that, I learned more and more about child development, child injury, um, and how families managed those things. Um, and the more I learned, the more I wanted to do. And Coincidentally, I had started a CPR and first aid training business and started doing some um, pretty basic CPR and first aid training, started doing some event safety, staffing EMTs for venues and the like, and started doing some CPR and first aid training for schools. And it turned out that one of our schools said to me, well, hey, can you help us with our disaster plan? I said, well, sure, I can take a look at that. And um, then they said, well, hey, we have this unique issue going on with a student that's on campus. Can you help us with that? Um, and I said, well, all right, we'll take a look at it. Let's see what we can do. And uh, organically and piece by piece, um, a program was born, and that's the um, creation of our school safety division at Joffe. Um, that started about eight years ago, and to this day, we continue to evaluate the program, improve the program, um, and work with new schools um, nationwide, and we're excited to do so. Um, that being said, um, today's focus is on emergency notifications, which are system, emergency notification systems, rather. Um, which is a key component of an emergency plan and emergency program. Um, without it, in fact, without an emergency notification system, it could be said that you can't have an emergency. Um, and that may sound odd, and you may actually decide that that's a good idea. You shouldn't invest in one. Um, but it's, it's relatively true. Uh, without communication and without notification and awareness that there is an emergency going on on campus or off campus, nobody's aware of the emergency. Nobody can respond to the emergency, and nobody can be able to participate in the response efforts. And so for some, they may not know that an emergency is going on, and they may actually be sort of blissfully ignorant. Um, for others, they may have the challenge of actually encountering or in facing that emergency, and that may cause all kinds of challenges for them. Um, so in order to have an emergency and to have it flow correctly, you absolutely must have an emergency notification system. And today, throughout the conversation, I'll likely refer to them as ENS, emergency notification systems. That, of course, differs from EMS, emergency medical uh, services. Um, and so I'll just ask that you remember that I am saying N today um, for notification. Um, so again, today we're going to talk about the notification systems, what they are, why you need one, um, some unique uh, intricacies about some of those that are out there. Um, we're going to talk about getting people on board. Um, who needs to be in the system? Who needs to use the system? Who needs to understand how to use the system in case they need to use the system, even though they're not the one that's supposed to use the system? Um, and finally, we'll take a few minutes to um, talk through any questions. Um, for those of you that have been with us throughout the series, um, we're doing this school safety webinar at 10 a.m. Pacific, at 1 p.m. Eastern, every Thursday. Um, and we've shared a couple of times throughout that your questions are so incredibly important to us. 
we are doing these webinars for a handful of different reasons, not the least of which is to ensure that we're appropriately empowering you to take action and to uh, manage safety and security and health and wellness um, for your school and for your students. Uh, that being said, feel free to ask any questions that you have there on the right-hand side of your screen. So let's jump in. And in fact, before we even do, I'll just take a second to um, to share with you um, that emergency notification systems are used to communicate an emergency, obviously. They're also used to, com uh, to contact emergency personnel. Um, they're used to notify and to communicate to the community, and they're used to provide necessary information to different parties. Now, as we talk about these four points, we're actually talking about four different emergency notification systems. Um, emergency notification systems is kind of a broad word. What we're thinking here is, number one, um, communicating to the community. At times, that is the most important. In terms of returning to normal operations, building and maintaining a resilient community, keeping your community empowered and inspired through and to the end of the emergency, and then allowing them to comfortably and safely and holistically come back to school the next day, um, certainly communication to the community is most important there. That said, it could also be said that the most important thing that you could do in an emergency is contact EMS or emergency personnel um, because those folks are actually going to help respond to and manage the emergency. Enough just to communicate to your own student community, let's say, or your own faculty community, uh, but you may need to communicate to your board. Uh, you may need to communicate to your general counsel you may need to communicate to any number of different audiences uh, at any point during the emergency. And um, oftentimes, an emergency notification system like Send Word Now or Regroup or um, anything else may be an option. Um, but other times, uh, you'll use something as simple as a phone. So today, we're going to talk through a couple of different options, um, both handheld phones, apps, uh, computer systems, etc. And hopefully by the end of the conversation, you'll be able to understand exactly what types you have in place and exactly what types you ultimately need in place. So why do you need it? Um, why do I need an emergency notification system in general? And here again, we're talking about the sort of core community-related emergency notification system. So regroup, send word now, a system that will allow you to call, text, and email everybody in your community all at once very, very quickly. Well, you need one, um, it, in fact, perhaps most importantly, because of the speed of the evolution of an emergency. It's often said that emergencies start and end in moments, and the aftermath is what takes so long. And that's a very logical and real and, and just factual statement based on our own experience in schools and in other emergencies. The emergency component or the emergency portion of the event tends to be the shortest amount of time. And it's matched then with the resumption of regular operations that tends to be the longest. When there's a fire on campus, um, within moments the fire has started. Within minutes, hopefully, the fire alarm has been pulled and the building has been evacuated. Within 10 to 15 to 20 minutes, the fire department should be on campus and should be helping us put the fire out. Within hours, the fire is out. The cleanup, as far as they're concerned, is done, what they call mop-up. Um, and we're ready to go back to our normal operation. But that may take us weeks or months. Well, the same thing's true in any emergency, and uh, the speed at which we need to respond is perhaps the most important metric that we use in any drill, in any emergency response, in any after action report. For incidents like a lockdown related to somebody on campus that doesn't belong there, whether they're an active shooter or somebody who just shows up and is wandering the campus, or of course that swarm of bees, um, a, an immediate response, something that happens within 10 to 60 seconds, is what allows us as a campus and a community to be prepared and resilient while we wait for the almost immediate response, which is, of course, the police. Put differently, when I recognize that something's happened, I can call 911 and simultaneously lock down my campus with an emergency notification system, but it's going to 
take the police several minutes to get there. And even once they do, it will take them a few more moments to mobilize and to get ready to, to act on whatever the situation is that they're managing. We can lock down a campus within less than a minute. And so locking down or evacuating the campus or frankly even communicating in an emergency all can happen in a matter of moments so long as we've got this emergency notification system in place. One of the things we talk about a lot during CPR and first aid training as well as uh, occasionally in emergency preparedness trainings is that in order for your brain to survive and in order for your brain to function, um, it actually needs oxygen. That hopefully isn't a surprise to anybody. Well, in order for it to start to deteriorate and to essentially go bad on us, it only takes about two minutes of no oxygen or uh, a little bit less than normal oxygen. Put differently, after two minutes, we start to deteriorate very rapidly and very dangerously. Well, again, if we're able to lock down an entire community and get response to that community in a matter of moments through an efficient and effective emergency notification system, we're generally going to be able to save and help more people than not. Now, I'm going to jump around for just a second. And um, because I just spoke about lockdowns and I talked about that person who was on campus, um, I'm going to jump into a different type of emergency notification system. And again, as we start the conversation today, um, we talked about the fact that there are different types of emergency notification systems, some that are um, community-based, some that are technology-based, some that are otherwise-based, um, some that are as simple as just picking up the phone and calling somebody. Certainly that's notification, and if it's an emergency, I suppose it's an emergency notification system. Well, the fire alarm on campus is also an emergency notification system, and the fire alarm on campus is generally used to help people know that it's time to evacuate. Um, when there's a big fire on campus, or a little fire for that matter, um, we expect that we will pull the fire alarm and our community will evacuate. I'll take just a moment to share a quick story with you now. Um, and that is that I had a school, and of course I won't tell you which school it is um, because this isn't one of my favorite stories of them. But there was a kiln, well there was a ceramics teacher and there was a kiln. And the ceramics teacher um, had the kiln fired up, was... Um, I forget the term that they used, uh, but was preparing a set of pots that were created by the students and all of a sudden the kiln uh, caught fire. And so the ceramics teacher and her eight students got up, evacuated the building, got out to the front of the building and called 911. It was an incredible response. 911 got there and 911 pulled up and 911 said, well, hey, where's everybody else? And the ceramics teacher with sort of a, a pale face went, uh-oh. I forgot to pull the fire alarm. <laughs> so 250 or so students, um, another 60 to 70 adults um, were still in the building and the kiln was still on fire, um, but the ceramics department was okay and of course the students in the, the pots were okay, um, at least those that they had gotten out of the, the kiln before they left. Um, so the fire alarm is an imperative notification resource and it's something that we have to use every time. It's something that we in fact, find ourselves challenging staff and faculty to go and pull. Um, well, oftentimes people are afraid. They think, well, it's going to make a loud noise, or they've heard a rumor that it might shock them or have ink in the system that might stain them for life. Um, there, there are a lot of different uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions that go around a fire alarm. But in short, if there's a fire on campus, it should be pulled, whether it's by a staff member, a faculty member, a student. If there's not a fire alarm on or rather a fire on campus, of course the fire alarm shouldn't be pulled. Well, that stands to reason in lockdowns too. Um, many years ago, not uh, five to ten um, years ago, uh, we had this thought that in a, in a lockdown setting where somebody or something was on campus that didn't belong, perhaps the best thing for us to do would be to pull the fire alarm. And as I mentioned, when we pull the fire alarm, our expected response is that everybody evacuates. And of course, if there's somebody or something on campus that doesn't belong, an evacuation can be sort of a bad idea. And so rather than pulling the fire alarm, rather than attempting to evacuate everybody from their classroom or office or wherever they are, what we want to do when there's a, a somebody or something on campus that doesn't belong is actually send out a direct notification that gives them specific instructions. I have a handful of schools that 
will use a system like a fire alarm, but not um, for a lockdown or um, other type of uh, police or human created emergency. Um, and that's a siren. Um, so a few schools that have a really loud siren or a really loud horn, um, those are certainly options. Um, they tend to be best used on university campuses, believe it or not, um, because those campuses tend to be even larger than some of the largest K-12s, not to say that we don't have some K-12s that are bigger than any university I've ever seen. Um, but because of the size of the campus, and of, again, because of the need to communicate to such a wide audience so quickly, sometimes we do have to get kind of creative with how we communicate. Nonetheless, um, fire alarms should not be pulled during or for an, a lockdown or otherwise um, human-created emergency. Now, the other part of this, and of course, as we talked about this um, here, we were thinking and focusing on pulling the fire alarm in order to start the lockdown process. The other challenge that we find is that every once in a while, the fire alarm is pulled mid or towards the end of the lockdown process. Now, I have a handful of schools that historically actually would call a lockdown using whatever means they had, and then they'd pull the fire alarm, and that would signal the students and the staff and the faculty and anybody else on campus it was safe to evacuate. The challenge is that that system is not very secure, and in fact, every once in a while, in a person-related emergency where somebody's on campus that doesn't belong, they pull the fire alarm. And so rather than actually training the staff and the faculty and the students to respond to the fire alarm during the lockdown, what we like to do is to say, we've got an emergency notification system in place. With that, we'll be able to send you a text message, an email, and a phone call at a moment's notice. And so if you hear the fire alarm go off, give us that moment's notice, um, so, or rather give us that moment so that we can provide you that notice. And in doing so, we can keep our entire community safe. Now, of course, the rules change and the, games, the game changes when I see or smell fire or smoke, when I hear something that tells me that the area that I'm in is not safe. Um, and of course, we give this disclaimer on almost and during almost every conversation that we have. Emergencies are dynamic and they're fluid. Things change at a moment's notice. And so you do need to be prepared to do whatever you need to do. And again, that's you and your staff, faculty, and students. That said, in general, if the fire alarm is pulled while we're in lockdown, I ask our staff, our faculty, and our students to hold out, wait for us to get them a text message or a phone call or, of course, an email. Um, and again, if it doesn't feel safe to do so, then they need to respond differently. Uh, as I shared with you, um, in general, uh, we have when we uh, go to utilize the fire alarm, we've got good intentions. Um, we're trying to get people out. We're trying to ensure that people understand what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we are um, attempting to make sure that they actually understand what's going on. Um, but nonetheless, through all of those things, we're ending up with a more dangerous situation. Um, and again, I'll just share that for you because I actually combined two of those slides inadvertently. So um, for those of you following along on the PowerPoint afterwards, um, just don't want you to be um, thrown off by that. So now I'll ask you this question, and um, I, I'm not going to actually put the poll up on the screen for you, um, but I'm going to ask you to share your thoughts um, in a question form. And so you can just share those directly into the question box. Um, but who needs to be in your system? And I'll give you just a second to, to share those. And um, I'm thinking large groups here, so um, staff, faculty, camp counselors, whatever the case may be. Um, go ahead and share those with us in the question box. So I'm seeing parents, I'm seeing coaches, I'm seeing faculty, I'm seeing staff, I'm seeing administration, I'm seeing students, I'm seeing everyone, um, security, that's great. Um, Let's see here. 
other schools, interesting. Your head of school, yes, your board, yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Um, so some, a, a large number of groups. Um, I'll tell you that there are two groups that are the absolute most important, and some of you might want to call them three, and that's okay too. Um, but your faculty and staff and your students are the two most important groups to have in your emergency notification system. The reason for that, faculty and staff, of course, are going to be your agents in responding to an emergency, whether it's on campus or off. Um, if it's a lockdown or if it's a fire or it's a hurricane, whatever the case may be, your faculty and staff are going to be the group that is going to be there for you and that are going to really help you get your students sort of shepherded or herded to the right places. Now your students are so imperative because if your faculty and staff are doing what they often like to do, um, let's say teach, uh, they may not have their phones on them and they may have their phones on silent or some of them may even have their phones off. Well, if that's the case, it's imperative that somebody in that room, aka our students, has the ability to notify their teachers that there's a problem. Now, some of the emergency notification systems take it a step further. So they send a text, they send a phone call, they send an email, all of that's great. But the, some of these emergency notification systems will take it a step further and actually put a pop-up on a computer, whether it's a laptop or an iPad. Um, some of them will um, have strobes and beacons that you can install in your hallways and classrooms and so they'll you know, really notify you that something's going on. Some of them will tie into your PA system and will make a PA announcement. Um, some of them will tie into your phone system and just will make a phone intercom announcement or speakerphone announcement. Um, regardless, the reason that emergency notifications are, well I should say one of the reasons, that emergency notification systems are so important is that that's how we stage and create our initial response to an emergency. Well, if we can access all of the people on campus, presumably our staff and our faculty and our students, we're much more likely to be able to more quickly manage that emergency. And yet, I find that almost every school that I come into says either we don't have students that have cell phones, um, we don't have our students' cell phone numbers because we either don't aggregate them or we're concerned about the privacy laws that exist. Um, we feel like our teachers carry their phones with them more than our students um, or some combination of the above. Um, so what I'll challenge you to do, and, and today I haven't actually challenged you to do much because I recognize how big this conversation is. Um, but today I challenge you to go out and to take a look at your emergency notification system and find out if it does include your students. Now some of you will say, well, I'm at an ECC or I'm at an elementary school. My kids really don't have cell phones. Uh, they do. <laughs> uh, I've seen students as young as kindergarten with cell phones. Um, in fact, it, I, it's mind-blowingly uh, becoming more and more true. Um, and I get it. Some of you don't want to text your kindergartners that there's a lockdown or a swarm of bees or anything else, and that's okay. Um, certainly once we start to get into grades that are that low, we have to evaluate how appropriate each text message is um, for that age group. Um, and that varies based on the emergency that we're dealing with, the severity of it, and our technological abilities with our emergency notification system. Some of them will allow us to do really fancy things like change things up for different grades. Others of them will not allow us to get quite that creative. Um, but I'll challenge you nonetheless to go out to find out whether or not your emergency notification system currently has your students imported. If not, many of you will come back with, we can't make the change until next year, that's fine. Um, I understand that the best and easiest time to collect the data is during registration, and in order to make that happen seamlessly and smoothly, the best thing for us is to wait until next year, that's fine. Lay the groundwork this year, build the groups this year, get ready for it this year, talk to your students about it this year, um, change the culture so that everybody on campus knows that it's coming, and that way when it comes time to actually get the first message out, nobody's shocked by it. One of the things that challenges me about these emergency notification systems is that some of them are not just emergency systems, they're also marketing systems. And if that's the case, it actually turns out that we're not allowed to send more than X number of messages to any one participant or, or individual in the system. It, above and beyond that, means that they have the ability to opt out. And so if you're sending too many messages or you haven't prepared your community correctly, 
you may end up with opt-outs of your emergency list, and that's not something you want. And opt-outs, um, for those of you that uh, don't get to play with the marketing world very often, just basically means that somebody says, hey, I don't want this anymore. It's like unsubscribing from a spammy email. So your students have to be in the system. Your staff and faculty, of course, have to be in the system. The other groups to consider, parents are, of course, the next one to, to get incorporated because we communicate to the students and the staff in order to have them help us respond to the emergency. But we communicate to the parents really in order for parents to help us continue the response to the emergency at home. Emergencies come in all shapes and sizes, and in really, really big emergencies, oftentimes we actually need to leverage our parents and their communication skills with their own students to ensure that their, their students are able to come back to school. Beyond that, we mentioned some groups earlier, uh, your board, your security team, if they're separate, third party, if they're not staff already. Um, your safety consulting team should be in your emergency notification system. For all of our schools, one of the first documents that they get when they sign on uh, with us is an emergency integration guide. And so they actually get our emergency number, and then we incorporate ourselves into their emergency notification system so that if they send out a message that says lockdown, that we can prepare our response. And then we can start our communications, we can start our travel, um, all of the things that need to go along with our response to help them through that emergency. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, there was an inadvertent false alarm at one of our schools where they activated a lockdown. We got a notification about it. It wasn't a scheduled drill. It was actually an extra impromptu drill. It was like the school was playing a trick on us. And sure enough, within about seven minutes, we were on campus uh, and saying, why, are we, why is this a drill? Uh, where are the police? Um, but it, being incorporated, into, being incorporated rather into the emergency notification system allows us to participate in that response and allows us to ensure that we can help prepare you. Um, and of course, above and beyond that, you're welcome to add anybody else that you'd like to. How do you get people signed up? Well, it varies from system to system. I'll share with you in a few moments the regroup process and some of the, the items that go along with it. Stay tuned for actually some blog uh, content and other articles that you may see coming up in the next couple of days because we're actually going to be sharing some of our partners with you. Regroup and SendWord now are our two partners. Um, there's some information from them though about exactly how to sign people up, how to enroll people, whether you can do self-enrollment, meaning put out a link and have everybody opt in or try to find their way to it online. That's not very common incidentally. Or um, we can import or, of course, we can always sync the databases, oftentimes sync the databases and things like that. Um, the next thing that I'm going to challenge you to do, and when we talk about getting people, you know, onto and with the picture, with the system, um, the last thing that I like to try and do with them is to incorporate the emergency notification system into our drills. It sounds silly. But the difference between a lockdown drill where we just walk around the classroom, walk around the school and say to each classroom, it's time to lock down, it's time to lock down, and a lockdown drill where we send a text message out is incredible. It, it's, it, it's almost not measurable. And the reason for that is that we're using the real systems, we're using the real process, we're using the real anxiety, but we're also testing to make sure that our systems work. Because occasionally there will be a glitch or an error with the system, maybe a database syncing error or maybe something else, um, but we're all of a sudden calls and texts don't go out. And if we don't know that until the live emergency, of course you don't need me to tell you that that's not a great thing. On the flip side, if we use it for every drill and we're actively participating and preparing our staff and faculty and ensuring that students are getting the messages and voicing ways for them to get into the database if they're for some reason not getting the message or if they're contact information has changed, we allow them to really understand what the real emergency will be like and to be that much more prepared for it. Um, again, I haven't challenged you and, and intend not to challenge you on all too much today um, because the challenges that I'm sharing with you are big. Of course, the worst case scenario when we practice with using an emergency notification system is we send out a message to our entire community that we did not mean to send out to our entire community. It is a real possibility. Um, whether it's a message that says that this is a X, Y, or Z emergency and we forget the word drill, which does occasionally happen, or it's a message that says 
this is an X, Y, or Z drill, and we have just a spelling error that makes us look silly, or whether we just tell them it's the wrong drill altogether and we ask them to do the wrong things. It can be very intimidating and challenging um, to send out a message. And so, in fact, not only does it prepare your community, and not only do I not mind the challenge or the risk of accidentally sending out an incorrect message, it empowers and prepares the person who does send the messages and ensures that they remember what their steps are too. So your first challenge from today, and um, in fact these are both on this slide, uh, is to take a look at your system and identify whether or not your students are in it. And if so, pat yourself on the back, and that's part of it. You have to make sure and do that. Um, but if not, uh, identify a way to get them in and start laying the groundwork this year so that by next year that you can actually get them incorporated. Number two, incorporate your emergency notification system into every drill that you do. The only drill that I can see where we might not want to or regularly use our emergency notification system is a fire drill. And that's because we are actually using a different type of system. It's just the fire alarm. So with all that said, um, let's take a look at a couple of products. So Regroup is one of our partners, and as I shared earlier, um, this is the type of notification system that's going to allow you to mass communicate to a bunch of different devices via several different means. And in fact, you can send a Regroup message from the web. You can send a Regroup message from, the, uh, from a, a phone. You can send a Regroup message from... Uh, of course, an iPad or whatever the case may be, um, and you can send or set up a regroup message to go out automatically at specific times. You can get a regroup message on your email, your cell phone, your your work phone, your home phone, anywhere, anywhere you want, frankly. You can actually get it on social media. You can find them occasionally in uh, the Google search engines. Um, one of our schools had a pretty critical event happen um, just a couple of months ago, and within about 15 minutes, people were Googling the school to find out what had happened. Well, within about 20 minutes, we had the ability to change the Google page that was showing up. And so with some pre-thought-out messaging and um, a lot of good legwork that was done prior to that occurrence, we were able to get a lot of control about what was spread and what was being said in the media because we were the ones sharing it. Um, Nonetheless, uh, Regroup is a, a message spreading system. It's a message disbursement system um, and can send to a whole lot of different places at the very same time and, in fact, is really reliable in the sense that in an event even as large as, let's say, Katrina or um, Hurricane Sandy last year or two years ago now, wow, um, we actually have the ability to uh, get these messages out in spite of all of the challenges that go on with cell phone reception and other challenges that just go on in those types of emergencies. Um, we can also create a large number of groups, and that's one of the unique things about Regroup that I really enjoy. So in Regroup, when we create a group, it's going to be a group like 6th grade or 4th grade. But then we can also create a group called science class going on a field trip to X, Y, or Z place. And then we can create a group called art class going out back for a walk up into the hills behind the school. And one student can be in all three of those groups and it's totally okay. And if we send out a message to all three of those groups because we have a message that actually needs to go to everyone, they're only going to get that message once. But if we send a message to that group that is the science class going on a field trip, they'll also get that message. And so we have the ability to sort of bifurcate and change how we send our messages and who gets them for what and why. One of the other really common uses, and this isn't necessarily emergency related, um, but we find ourselves using Regroup and um, other emergency notification systems when buses run late. Um, so if the school bus is a few minutes late or the school bus has an accident, blows a tire, uh, we oftentimes find ourselves using systems like this to communicate that those things have occurred and to make sure that parents understand when their kids are going to be picked up um, or how they're supposed to respond from here. The more you use it, the better you get. The better you get, the faster you are in an emergency. So if that's a system that's used sort of to communicate to the internal community, 
then I'll share with you a system that's used to um, speak to the external community. The rave panic button allows you the ability to communicate from the inside, um, so somebody like your security guard or somebody like your ceramics teacher, we'll go back to that same teacher, um, has the ability to pick up their phone and find an app and actually activate a series of, of events. Um, in this case, we can um, hit activate, which is that big red button on the screen. Um, and what we want is we want to activate the police. Well, we have the ability to do that because we've got, um, and rather that says active shooter, not activate. Um, so rather if we hit active shooter, that will activate um, the process. Um, and so we have the ability in this case to immediately activate the police. Um, call 911. Uh, make sure that we figure out exactly what we need to do from here. Potentially send out a message through Regroup. Uh, but this is a communication system where we're actually going from one person to a variety of different events, whereas in the Regroup or Send Word Now examples, we're going from one person to a controlled response that we're actually asking for. Um, put differently, both systems can actually work together and in parallel and be even more successful than either independently. In general, you'll always need an emergency notification system that allows you to text, email, and call. And then your supplemental layer, and again, both will work harmoniously together. That's, that's even better. Um, but the rave or the panic button type solution would more than likely be an additional or a um, supplementary tool. Um, with that said, um, I again only gave you two challenges today um, because those challenges are indeed so challenging. Um, so what I'd like to ask you to do is um, let us know if you have any questions now. And of course, you can go ahead and share those with us on the right-hand side of the screen here. Know that you've done so. Um, if you um, have any questions or challenges as you go about trying to uh, identify whether or not your students are in the system or trying to incorporate them into your drills. If your head of school says, no, we're not doing it because I'm afraid of the challenges that could go along with sending out an incorrect message or making a mistake, um, let us know. And it's not to say that we'll be able to solve the problem for you, but we'll certainly be there to try and help. Um, as we do with all of these conversations, I'd like to invite you to a couple of things. The first is I'd like to share with you that coming up in the next couple of weeks, we've got several more really incredible webinars um, planned. So we have next Wednesday, September 9th, we're actually doing a special back to school workshop. Uh, this is an immunization workshop, and so it'll give you the opportunity to um, spend some time with us and talk very specifically about immunizations, how they work, um, and it's actually a repeat by request from a couple of weeks ago where we talked specifically in California. Um, this particular one will be uh, limited to 30 participants, so sign up quickly. There are not very many seats left, um, but it'll be some pretty one-on-one -on -one time where we can talk through unique policies and challenges that you may have on campus. Following that, um, Thursday, next week will be a busy week, uh, we'll be talking about planning your October drill, so whether you're doing shakeout or you're doing prepare for winter, um, we will be able to talk through how to set those drills up and ensure you're doing them effectively and ensure that leading up to them you're creating and, and setting everybody up for success. The following Thursday we'll be talking about movement restriction and then finally to round out September uh, we'll be talking about who's required to have AEDs, who ought to have AEDs, and who ought not to have AEDs, although that, I'll tell you, uh, spoiler alert, that number is small. Um, again, if you have any questions um, please feel free to let us know and we'll get you squared away. Thanks so much for being with us today. And again, that email address that was just chatted out to you, schools at joffeemergencyservices.com, training at joffeemergencyservices.com, or give us a call at any time. Thank you so much for being with us, and we can't wait to see you next week.